This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by Cherie Terrio. Anthem by Anne Ran. Chapter 1. It is a sin to write this. It is a sin to think words no others think and to put them down on a paper no others are to see. It is base and evil. It is as if we are speaking alone to no ears but our own. And we know well that there is no transgression blacker than to do or think alone. We have broken the laws. The laws say that men may not write unless the Council of Vocations bid them so. May we be forgiven. But this is not the only sin upon us. We have committed a greater crime, and for this crime there is no name. What punishment awaits us if it be discovered, we know not, for no such crime has come in the memory of men, and there are no laws to provide for it. It is dark here. The flame of the candle stands still in the air. Nothing moves in this tunnel save our hand on the paper. We are alone here under the earth. It is a fearful word, alone. The laws say that none among men may be alone, ever and at any time. For this is the great transgression and the root of all evil. But we have broken many laws. And now there is nothing here save our one body, and it is strange to see only two legs stretched on the ground, and on the wall before us the shadow of our one head. The walls are cracked and water runs upon them in thin threads without sound, black and glistening as blood. We stole the candle from the larder of the home of the street sweepers. We shall be sentenced to ten years in the palace of corrective detention if it be discovered. But this matters not. It matters only that the light is precious and we should not waste it to write when we need it for that work which is our crime. Nothing matters save the work our secret, our evil, our precious work. Still, we must also write, for may the council have mercy upon us, we wish to speak for once to no ears but our own. Our name is Equality 72521, as it is written on the iron bracelet which all men wear on their left wrist with their names upon it. We are twenty-one years old. We are six feet tall, and this is a burden, for there are not many men who are six feet tall. Ever have the teachers and leaders pointed to us, and frowned and said, There is evil in your bones, Equality 72521, for your body has grown beyond the bodies of your brothers, but we cannot change our bones, nor our body. We were born with a curse. It has always driven us to thoughts which are forbidden. It has always given us wishes which men may not wish. We know that we are evil, but there is no will in us and no power to resist it. This is our wonder and our secret fear that we know and do not resist. We strive to be like all of our brother men, for all men must be alike. Over the portals of the palace of the World Council there are words cut in marble which we are required to repeat to ourselves whenever we are tempted. <clears throat> we are one in all and all in one. There are no men but only the great we, one indivisible and forever. We repeat this to ourselves, but it helps us not. These words were cut long ago. There is a green mold in the grooves of the letters and yellow streaks on the marbles, which come from more years than men could count. And these words are truth, for they are written on the palace of the World Council, and the World Council is the body of all truth. Thus has it been ever since the great rebirth, and farther back than that no memory can reach. But we must never speak of the times before the great rebirth, else we are sentenced to three years in the palace of corrective detention. It's only the old ones who whisper about it, in the evenings, in the home of the useless. They whisper many strange things. 
of the towers which rose to the sky in those unmentionable times, and of the wagons which moved without horses, and of the lights which burned without flame. But those times were evil, and those times passed away, when men saw the great truth, which is this, that all men are one, and that there is no will save the will of all men together. All men are good and wise. It is only we, equality 72521, we alone, who were born with a curse. For we are not like our brothers. And as we look back upon our life, we see that it has ever been thus, and that it has brought us step by step to our last supreme transgression, our crime of crimes hidden here under the ground. We remember the home of the infants where we lived till we were five years old, together with all the children of the city who had been born in the same year. The sleeping halls there were white and clean and bare of all things save one hundred beds. We were just like all our brothers then, save for one transgression. We fought with our brothers. There were few offenses blacker than to fight with our brothers at any age and for any cause whatsoever. The council of the home told us so, and of all the children of that year, we were locked in the cellar most often. When we were five years old, we were sent to the home of the students, where there were ten wards for our ten years of learning. Men must learn till they reach their fifteenth year, then they go to work. In the home of the students, we arose when the big bell rang in the tower, and we went to our beds when it rang again. Before we removed our garments, we stood in the great sleeping hall, and we raised our right arms, and we said all together, with the three teachers at the head, We are nothing. Mankind is all. By the grace of our brothers are we allowed our lives. We exist through by and for our brothers who are the state. Amen. Then we slept. The sleeping halls were white and clean and bare of all things, save one hundred beds. We, Equality 72521, were not happy in those years in the home of the students. It was not that the learning was too hard for us. It was that the learning was too easy. This is a great sin to be born with a head which is too quick. It is not good to be different from our brothers, but it is evil to be superior to them. The teachers told us so, and they frowned when they looked upon us. So we fought against this curse. We tried to forget our lessons, but we always remembered. We tried not to understand what the teachers taught, but we always understood it before the teachers had spoken. We looked upon Union 53992, who were a pale boy with only half a brain, and we tried to say and do as they did, that we might be like them, like Union 53992, but somehow the teachers knew that we were not, and we were lashed more often than all the other children. The teachers were just, for they had been appointed by the councils, and the councils are the voice of all justice, for they are the voice of all men. And if sometimes, in the secret darkness of our heart, we regret that which befell us on our fifteenth birthday, we knew that it was through our own guilt. We had broken a law, for we had not paid heed to the words of our teachers. The teachers had said to us all, Dare not choose in your mind the work you would like to do when you leave the home of the students. You shall do what the Council of Vocations shall prescribe for you, for the Council of Vocation knows in its great wisdom where you are needed by your brother men, better than you can know it in your unworthy little minds. And if you are not needed by your brother men, there is no reason for you to burden the earth with your bodies. We knew this well in the years of our childhood but our curse broke our will. We were guilty and we confessed it here. We were guilty of the great transgression of preference. We preferred some work and some lessons to others. 
we did not listen well to the history of the councils elected since the great rebirth. But we love the science of things. We wish to know. We wish to know about all the things which make the earth around us. We asked so many questions that the teachers forbade it. We think that there are mysteries in the sky and under the water and in the plants which grow. But the Council of Scholars has said that there are no mysteries. And the Council of Scholars knows all things. And we learn much from our teachers. We learn that the earth is flat and that the sun revolves around it, which causes the day and night. We learned the names of all the winds which blow over the seas and push the sails of our great ships. We learned how to bleed men to cure them of all ailments. We loved the science of things, and in the darkness, in the secret hour, when we awoke in the night, and there were no brothers around us, but only their shapes in the beds and their snores, we closed our eyes, and we held our lips shut, and we stopped our breath, that no shudder might let our brothers see or hear or guess, and we thought that we wished to be sent to the home of the scholars, when our time would come. All of the great modern inventions come from the home of scholars, such as the newest one, which was found only a hundred years ago, of how to make candles from wax and string. Also, how to make glass, which is put in our windows to protect us from the rain. To find these things, the scholars must study the earth and learn from the rivers, from the sands, from the winds and the rocks. And if we went to the home of scholars, we could learn from these also. We could ask questions of these, for they do not forbid questions. And questions give us no rest. We know not why our curse makes us seek. We know not what ever and ever, but we cannot resist it. It whispers to us that there are great things on this earth of ours, that we must know them. We ask, why must we know? But it has no answer to give us. This is a LibriVox recording. We must recording. know All that LibriVox recordings we may know. Public domain. For so we wish to be sent to, to the home of scholars. We wished it so much that our hands trembled under the blankets in the night, and we bit our arm to stop that other pain which Anthem we could not endure. Chapter two. It was evil, and we dared not Liberty face our brothers 3, in the morning, for Liberty men five, may wish 3, nothing for themselves. Liberty five, 3, and we were punished when the Council we of Vocations to came to give us our life mandates. But we dare not speak which tell those who reach their fifteenth year what their women, work is to be for the rest of their days. Of men. The but Council of Vocations of came in on the first day of spring, and they sat in the Great Hall. Liberty, and we, who were fifteen, and all the and teachers, came into the Great Hall. And the Council of Vocations sat assigned to work the on a high day, and the they had but the two city, words to speak to each of the students. They called the students' names. And when, and when the students step before them, must keep one this road clean after another, first the council said, post. Carpenter, there is a hedge along or the doctor, road, and the hedge or cook, lies the fields. or leader. The fields are then black each student plowed, raised their right and arm and like said, great The will of our brothers be done. Gathered in some hand now, if the council the said sky, Carpenter, or cook, forth from that hand, the students so assigned go to work as and do not study any further. Like black but if the council has said, with Leader, green then those students go to the home of Women the leaders, work in the fields, which is and the greatest house in the city, in the wind are like for it has three stories. And there they study for many years so that they and may become candidates we and be elected to the city council and the state walking council along the and the world council their body was by a free and, and general vote of all iron. men. Their eyes but were we dark wish not to be a leader, glowing, even though no it is a great honor. No we wish to be a scholar. And no guilt. So we their awaited our turn in the great hall, the and then we heard the council of vocations call our name, as if it equality, to seven, two, five, two, one. We walked to the dais, and our legs did not tremble, to and we looked up at the council. Gift. There were five the members of the council, under their feet. three we of the male still, gender the and two of the female. Fear, and then their the hair pain. was white, and their and faces we were cracked still, as the clay of a dry river bed. More they were old. The they seemed older we than the marble of the temple of the world council. They sat before us, and they did not move, and we saw no breath to stir the folds of their white togas. 
and we but stood we knew watching that them they were alive till their white for tunic was lost the hand in the blue of the mist. oldest rose and the following to day as we came to the northern again. road we kept our eyes this was upon the only thing which moved in field. for the lips of the and oldest each day thereafter, did not move as we they knew said. the illness of waiting for our hour on the northern road we felt the and cords of our neck grow tight five, three thousand as our head rose day. higher we knew to look upon not the faces whether they looked at us also and we were happy think they did we knew we had been then one day but they now we had a way to, to atone and for suddenly it. they turned to we us. We would accept our they life turned mandate, in a whirl, and, and we the would movement work of their bodies for our brothers as gladly if off, and willingly, as and we would erase our sin started, against them, which they, they did not still know, as a stone, but we knew. They looked straight upon us, for we were happy in and our proud eyes. of ourselves there and of the no victory over ourselves. And no welcome. We raised our right arm and we spoke, and our voice was the clearest, the steadiest voice in the hall that day, and we said. The but will the of our brothers day, be came done. To the road, they smiled. And we looked straight into the eyes they of the council, us and for but their us. eyes were as and cold we as an blue answer. glass buttons. Their head fell back, and their arms so we went into the home of the street sweepers. And their thin white it is a gray house on a narrow street. There is a sundial in the courtyard they were not by which the council us, of the home the can tell the hours of the day then they glanced and when to ring the bell. And we felt when as the bell rings, we arise from our beds. Slipping softly the sky is green and cold feet. in our windows to the east. Every morning, and the shadow on the sundial marks off our eyes. a half hour we while we dress speak. and eat our breakfast in the dining hall, to speak to men of other where there are five long Saving tables with twenty clay the plates meetings. and twenty clay but cups once, standing on each at the table. Hedge, we then we go to our work our in the streets and of the then city moved it slowly, palm with our brooms down and our rakes. Five, in five but hours, the when the sun it, is high, they would have we return to the home, for it looked only as if we and were shading we our eyes our for the sun. Meal, for but which Liberty one five, half hour is allowed. Saw it, and we go to work again. They raised their in five hours, the shadows are blue on the pavements, and the sky is blue. each day, we greet with a deep brightness, which is not bright. And they answer, and no man can We come back to have our dinner, which lasts one hour. We do not wonder at. Then the bell rings and ours. we walk in a straight it column is our to one of the city halls of preference. for the social well, we meeting. We do not think of all of the brothers Other as columns we must, of men arrive but from only the homes of the different trades. And their name is Liberty The 5, candles 3, are lit and the councils of we the do different not think homes of why we think stand of them. in a pulpit. We do not know why. And they speak to when us we of our duties them, and our brother men. Of a sudden that the then visiting leaders and that mount the pulpit and they read to us. Us, the speeches we do not think of which them were as made five, 3, in the city council that day. We have given them a name. For the city council represents all men, the and all men must know. But it is a sin. Then we to sing give hymns: men, the hymn of brotherhood, the hymn of equality, and the hymn of the collective spirit. Yet we call them the golden one. The sky but is they a soggy not purple. Like the others. We return to the home. The golden one. Then the bell rings, not and like we walk in a straight column to the city theater for three hours of social recreation. that men may not think of women. There a play is shown upon the stage with two great choruses when all the men home of the actors and all the women speak and answer all together for one night to the city palace of mating. The plays are about toil and how good it is. Then we walk back to the home in a straight column. Children are born each winter, but women never see their children. Pierced and by children silver never drops know that tremble. Twice ready to burst have we been sent through. to the palace of mating. The moths but beat against the street lanterns, of which we, we go to like our to beds think. and we sleep. Till we the had bell broken rings so many again. laws, and today the sleeping halls are white and clean and today bare of all things. We spoke to save one hundred beds. The other woman Thus we have lived the each day when we of stopped four at the hedge by the side until of the road, two springs the ago were kneeling when our crime moat, happened, which runs through the field. Thus, and the must drops of all water falling live from their until hands they are forty. As they raise the 40, water to their lips, they're worn out. Were like at sparks 40, of fire. They're the sent sun. to the home of the useless. Then the golden ones, where the old ones live, and they did not. The move, old ones do not work, there, for the state takes care of them. And circles they sit in the sun in summer, and they sit by the fire in winter. They do not speak often. For they and are one weary. sparkling drop the old ones fell know the of that they are soon to die. The when a miracle happens, then and the golden someone lives to be forty-five, to the hedge, they as are the they ancient ones. A command and children eyes. stare at them when the passing two other by the home of the useless. Of our brigade were Such is away to down be our road. life, as and that of all our brothers four, and of the brothers who came before us. Not betray us. And Such five, would have three, been our nine, life two, had we not, not committed understand. our crime, which so has changed the all things one, for and us. We saw the shadows and it was our curse which drove us to our crime. Of sun we had been lips. a good street sweeper, and, we said, and like all our brothers' street sweepers, five, save for our cursed wish their to know, did not move, and they did we not looked too long eyes. at the stars at night Only and at the trees and the earth. And when we cleaned the yard of the home of the scholars, 
triumph over We gathered us, the glass vial things we could the not pieces guess. of metal then they the dried asked, bones what which they had discarded We wish to keep Equality, these things and to study them but we had we no answered. place to hide them so we you carried them to the city cesspool, and then we made the discovery. For we do not wish it was on a day of the spring before last. We, cannot we street say sweepers what they meant, worked in brigades there are no of three, and we were meaning. with Union but five, we knew it three, nine, words, nine, two. and we knew it then. They no, of the half brain, we answered. and with international no, you one of four, our sisters. eight, eight, one, eight. If you could now see Union among scores of women, nine, nine, will you two, look upon us? were a sickly lad, and sometimes we shall look upon you, they were stricken with convulsions. We see you among when their mouths the the froths and their eyes turn asked, white. Are but international four eight eight, eight one city? eight are different. Or do they always work in the same they places? They are tall, strong. They Youth, always work and in, in the their same eyes. Places, we answered, are like fireflies. And no one will take this word There's away from us. laughter in their eyes. We cannot look Your upon eyes, international they say, are not like the eyes of any among men. And answer. For and this, suddenly, without cause, they were not liked in the home us, of the students. We felt cold, as it were not cold proper to, to smile without reason. How and old also, are you? They were not we liked asked. because they took pieces of coal. They understood and they our drew thought, pictures upon the walls. But they lowered their eyes. And they the were pictures time. which made men laugh. Seventeen. But it is only our brothers in the home and of we the sighed, artist, as if a burden which had been taken from us. Draw for he had been thinking without so international the four meeting, eight eight one eight. We thought that we would not let the golden one be sent to the, of the street sweepers. How to like prevent ourselves. it? How to bar the will of the council? International four eight eight one eight. And that we would our friends. Only this is an evil we do not thing know to say, why such thought for it is a great for transgression. These ugly matters bear no the great transgression of to us preference, and the golden one to love what any among men better than the others. Still, Since without we reason, must love as we stood all there by the hedge, all we felt our, our lips friends. drawn tight with hatred. So international a sudden hatred for all our brother and men, we have never and the golden one it. saw it. But we and know, smiled slow, we know slowly. when we look into each other's eyes, and there and when was we look in their thus smile, without words, the first sadness we both we know them. other things. We think also. that in the wisdom of strange women, the golden one had, for which there are no words words than we can and understand, things frighten us. Then three of the so sisters on that day of the spring appeared, before last, coming toward the road, Union five, so the golden three, one nine, walked nine, away two, from us. Were stricken with convulsions on the, the edge of the city, and they threw near the, seeds the city theater. The furrows of earth. We left them to lie away. in the shade of the theater but tent, the and we went wildly, with International four eight eight one eight to finish trembling. our work. We came together yeah, to we the great ravine the behind the, the theater. Sweepers, we felt that we wanted to sing. It is empty, save for trees and weeds. So we were behind the ravine. There is a plain. And behind in the, the plain, dining hall, there lies without knowing it, the uncharted we begun to forest, sing aloud some tune about we had which never men heard, must but not, it is not think. proper to sing without reason. We were gathering the papers the and the rags which the wind had blown from the we theater. We are singing because we are happy. When we saw an iron answered, bar among the weeds, the one of the home council it was who old reprimanded and rusted us. by many rains. Indeed, you are happy. They we answered. pulled with all our strength, but we could How not else move can it. Men be so we when called International for their four eight eight one eight. And, and now, together we here in our the tunnel, around the we bar wonder about these of words. A, a it is forbidden. The earth fell not in before to be us. happy, and we saw an old as iron grill over us, a black men hole. Men are free, and the earth belongs to International them. International four eight eight one eight. And all things on back. earth belong to all but men. But we pulled at the grill, and, and it the will of all men together is and good for all. And then we saw iron rings and steps so all men leading down a shaft happy. into a darkness without Yet, bottom. Yet, as we stand at night in the great we shall hall, go down, removing our garments, we said to sleep. International four eight eight one eight. We look upon our brothers and we wonder. It is forbidden. They the heads of our brothers are bowed. We said the eyes of our brothers are. The council does not know of this hole. Never do they look so it cannot be forbidden. The shoulders and they of answered. our brothers are hunched, Since the council does the not know of this drawn, hole, there could be no law permitting to enter and it, to and everything which is not permitted by law is forbidden. A word steals but we said, our mind as we, we shall go brothers, nonetheless. And that word is they were frightened, but they stood by and watched us go. In the air of the we hung on the iron the rings the with our hands and our feet. Fear walks we could see nothing city, below us, and above us the hole opened upon the sky grew smaller and smaller. Till it we came to be the size of a button. We are in the home of the but still, sweepers. we went but down. Here in our tunnel, then our foot touched no the ground. Longer. We rubbed the our eyes, under the for we could not see. No odor then our eyes became used and to the darkness, three hours and we could not believe for what we saw. Hours above the ground. No man known to us our could have built this place, for the council nor the men known to our brothers who lived before us. It is not and good yet, to feel too much joy, nor to be glad that our body lives. 
Its walls were hard and smooth to the touch. It felt like stone, but it wasn't stone. On the ground there were long, thin tracks of iron, but it was not iron. It felt smooth and cold as glass. We knelt and we crawled forward, our hands groping along the iron line to see where it would lead. But there was an unbroken night ahead. There are Only the iron tracks flowed through it, a quiet boy and white, with wise, calling kind eyes, who cries but we could not follow, reason, for we were losing the puddle of light day behind night, us. And so we turned and we crawled back, so they our hand on the iron line, and our heart there beat in our solidarity, fingertips, nine, without six, reason. Three, four, seven, and then who are we bright knew. Youth, we knew suddenly the that this place was left but from the unmentionable times. So it was true, and those times had been. And all the, the wonders night, of those times, and a voice which hundreds upon hundreds bones, of years ago, the men knew secrets which we have lost. And, and we as thought, we all undress this at is a night, foul place. In the dim light of candles, they are damned to touch the things of the unmentionable they dare times. Not speak the but our hand, which followed the track, for as all we must crawled, agree with clung all. to the iron and as if it would not know if their thoughts as if the skin of our hand were thirsty and begging of the metal some secret fluid and they are glad when the candles are blown for the night. We returned to the earth, and we, equality International 48818, looked upon us and stepped back. And there Equality, is peace in the seven, sky, two, five, and two, one. And dignity. They said, "Your and face is white." The there lies the plain, but we could not plain, speak. Black, and we stood upon looking the black upon sky, them. There lies the uncharted forest. They backed away, to look as if they dared the not touch forest. us. We did not then wish they to smiled, think of it. but, but it was not do a our eyes smile. return to that black patch upon the sky? It was lost and pleading. Men never but still, enter we the could not speak. Forest. Then they there said, is no power to We shall report no our to find to the city council, and both of us will be rewarded. And then we spoke. It is our voice was that hard, and there was no mercy. Years, one in among our the voice. men of the city escaped we said, alone and run into the we uncharted forest. We shall not report our find to the city call council. Or reason. We shall not report it These to men any do not men. Return. They, they raised their hands to their ears, for never had they heard. Roam the forest. Such words. But our council say this is only international four eight eight one eight. We have heard many uncharted forests. Will you report us to the council the and see us lashed to and death before your that they eyes? Have grown over the ruins they stood straight of, cities of a sudden, of the and they answered, times. "Rather the would we die." The then we said, the "Keep silent. The ruins, this place is ours. Which this place belongs to us." And as we look Equality upon the uncharted seven, forest two five far two one, in the night, and to no other men on earth, of the unmentionable and if we times, ever surrender it, how it came to we shall surrender our life with it also. The world. We have then we saw that the eyes of International Four Eight Eight One Eight were full to the lids with tears that dared not drop. They whispered, and their voice trembled. So that and their great words fires lost all raged shape. over the land. The will of the and council is above fires, all things, for it is the will burned. of our brothers, which is holy. But if you wish it so, we shall obey you. Rather shall we be evil all the with you the evil than good burned, with all our and brothers. With them all the words of the May evil the council ones. have mercy upon both great our hearts. Of flames then we walked away together and back to the home of the street sweepers. And we walked in silence. Thus did it come to pass that each night, when the, the stars are high, the and the street sweepers what sit the in the city theater, we, we, Equality 7, May 2, 5, 2, 1, mercy upon steal us. out we had and no run through the darkness to, write to our place. Such a question. It is easy to and leave we the theater not when the we candles are blown and it. the actors come onto we the stage. Not ask this question no eyes can see us shall not as we it. crawl under our we seat and under the cloth of the tent. Later. It is easy to and steal yet, through the shadows and fall in nine there is some next to word, International 48818 as men, the column leaves the theater. Has been. It is and dark is the in the streets, word, and there are no men no about, may speak for no here, men may walk through the city and when they have rare, no mission to walk there. One Each night we run word. to the ravine and they we remove the stones that we have piled upon the iron grill to hide it from men. Each night, for three hours, we are under the earth. Alone. There is no crime we have stolen candles from the home of the street sweepers. We have stolen flints and knives and paper. Words. And we have brought them to this place. We have, seen one we have stolen glass vials and powders and acids from the home of the scholars. Now we sit in the tunnel for three hours each night and, and we study. Us and follows us. 
and we melt strange no metals and we mix acids we were a child and we cut then, open the bodies old, of the animals which we, we stood find in the, the city cesspool with all the children and all we the have men built of the city an oven of the bricks that we gathered burning. in the streets we burn they the wood we the find in the ravine out the fire the flickers in the oven and, and the blue the shadows dance they upon the torn walls out the tongue of the and there is no sound of men to disturb us the transgressors. We have stolen manuscripts. Young, tall. This is a great they offense. Had hair of gold and eyes manuscripts of are precious. They For our brothers the in the home of the clerks, their step did not spend falter. one year to copy and one all the single script in, square, in their all clear the handwriting. And manuscripts and are rare, and they are them. kept in the home of Theirs the scholars. The calmest, so we sit under the earth face. and we read the stolen scripts. As the chains two years were wound have passed over since their we found body this place, the state, and in and these two years we have learned more than we had learned in the ten years at the home of the students. We have learned things which are not in the mouth. We have solved secrets of which the scholars have no knowledge. We have come to, to see then, how great is the us. unexplored, and how we many lifetimes will not bring us to the end of our quest. Of labor, the we of wish the councils, nothing the save to be alone rebirth, and to learn and to feel as never if seen with each saint. day our sight were the growing sharper than the hawks be. and clearer and we than the then, rock crystal. Standing in the square, Strange the are the ways of, of evil. Was the we are false we in the faces of our brothers. We are defying the will of, the of our counsels. Of we alone, of the thousands who walk the earth, As the we alone in this rose, hour are doing a work which, no which has no purpose save that we, we wish to do it. Today. The Perhaps evil of our crime is not for the human mind to probe. But the nature of our punishment, of the if it be discovered, had chosen is us not from the free for the human heart to ponder. Upon us. Never, there was not no in the memory in eyes, of the ancient and ones, no ancient. Of the agony of their body. never have men done what joy we are them. doing. And, pride, and yet, there is no shame in us, and no regret. Human we to say be. to ourselves that and we are a wretch and a traitor, to tell us but we feel no flames, burden upon our spirit, and no fear in our heart. Without and it seems to us seems that our spirit is clear, as a lake troubled and by no eyes, from us. save from those the of the sun. But the flames rose, and in our heart, and not guess strange are the ways of evil. What? In our heart, if we had there is the first it, like peace the we have pyre. known in what 20 years. What is the unspeakable years. word? End, End of, of chapter, chapter 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cherie Terrio. Anthem by Anne Ran, Chapter 3 We, Equality 72521, have discovered a new power of nature, and we have discovered it alone, and we are to know it. It is said, now let us be lashed for it, if we must. The Council of Scholars has said that we all know the things which exist, and therefore all the things which are not known by all do not exist but we think that the Council of Scholars is blind. The secrets of this earth are not for all men to see, but only for those who will seek them. We know, for we have found a secret unknown to all our brothers. We know not what this power is, nor whence it comes, but we know it is nature. We have watched it and worked with it. We saw it first two years ago, one night we were cutting open the body of a dead frog when we saw its leg jerking. It was dead, yet it moved. Some power unknown to men was making it move. We could not understand it. Then, after many tests, we found the answer. The frog had been hanging on a wire of copper and it had been the metal of our knife which had sent a strange power to the copper through the brine of the fog's body. We put a piece of copper and a piece of zinc into a jar of brine. We touched a wire to them, and there, under our fingers, was a miracle which had never occurred before, a new miracle and a new power. This discovery haunted us. We followed it, in preference to all our studies. We worked with it, we tested it in more ways than we can describe. 
and each step was another miracle unveiling before us. We came to know that we had found the greatest power on earth, for it defies all the laws known to men. It makes the needle move and turn on the compass which we stole from the house of scholars. But we had been taught, when still a child, that the lodestone points to the north, and this is a law which nothing can change. Yet our new power defies all laws. We found that it causes lightning, and never have men known what causes lightning. In thunderstorms we raised a tall rod of iron by the side of our hole and watched it from below. We have seen the lightning strike it again and again. And now we know that metal draws the power of the sky, and that metal can be made to give it forth. We have built strange things with this discovery of ours. We used it for the copper wires which we found here under the ground. We have walked the length of our tunnel with a candle lighting the way. We could go no further than a half a mile, for earth and rock had fallen at both ends. But we gathered all the things we found and we brought them to our workplace. We found strange boxes with bars of metal inside, with many cords and strands and coils of metal. We found wires that led to strange little globes of glass on the walls. They contained threads of metal thinner than a spider's web. These things help us in our work. We do not understand them. But we think that the men of the unmentionable times had known our power of the sky, and these things had some relation to it. We do not know, but we shall learn. We cannot stop now, even though it frightens us that we are alone in our knowledge. No single one can possess greater wisdom than the many scholars who are elected by all men for their wisdom. Yet we can. We do. We have fought against saying it, but now it is said. We do not care. We forget all men, all laws, and all things save our metals and our wires. So much is still to be learned. So long a road lies before us. And what care we if we must travel it alone? End of chapter 3 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cherie Terrio. Anthem by Anne Rand, Chapter 4. Many days passed before we could speak to the Golden One again, but then came the day when the sky turned white as if the sun had burst and spread its flame in the air, and the fields lay still without breath, and the dust of the road was white in the glow. So the women of the field were weary, and they tarried over their work, and they were far from the road when we came, but the golden ones stood alone at the hedge, waiting. We stopped, and we saw that their eyes, so hard and scornful to the world, were looking at us as if they would obey any word we might speak. And we said, We have given you a name in our thoughts, Liberty Five Three Thousand. What is our name? they asked. The Golden One. Nor do we call you Equality Seven Two Five Two One when we think of you. What name have you given us? They looked straight into our eyes, and they held their head high, and they answered, The Unconquered. For a long time we could not speak. Then we said, Such thoughts are forbidden, Golden One. But you think such thoughts as these, and you wish us to think them. We looked into their eyes, and we could not lie. Yes, we whispered, and they smiled, and then we said, Our dearest one, do not obey us. They stepped back, and their eyes were wide and still. Speak those words again, they whispered. Which words? we asked, but they did not answer, and we knew it. Our dearest one, we whispered. Never have men said this to women. The head of the Golden One bowed slowly, and they stood still before us, their arms at their sides, the palms of their hands turned to us, as if their body were delivered in submission to our eyes, and we could not speak. 
Then they raised their head, and they spoke simply and gently, as if they wished us to forget some anxiety of their own. The day is hot, they said, and you have worked for many hours, and you must be weary. No, we answered. It is cooler in the fields, they said, and there is water to drink. Are you thirsty? Yes, we answered, but we cannot cross the hedge. We shall bring the water to you, they said. Then they knelt by the moat. They gathered water into their two hands. They rose and they held the water out to our lips. We did not know if we drank that water. We only knew suddenly that their hands were empty, but we were still holding our lips to their hands, and that they knew it but did not move. We raised our head and stepped back, for we did not understand what had made us do this, and we were afraid to understand it. And the Golden One stepped back and stood looking upon their hands in wonder. Then the Golden One moved away, even though no others were coming, and they moved stepping back as if they could not turn from us, their arms bent before them as if they could not lower their hands. End of chapter 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Cherie Terrio Anthem by Anne Rand Chapter 5 We made it. We created it. We brought it forth from the night of the ages. We alone. Our hands. Our mind. Ours alone and only. We know not what we are saying. Our head is reeling. We look upon the light which we had made. We shall be forgiven for anything we say tonight. Tonight, after more days and trials than we can count, we finish building a strange thing from the remains of the unmentionable times. A box of glass devised to give forth the power of the sky of greater strength than we had ever achieved before. And when we put our wires to this box, when we closed the current, the wire glowed. It came to life. It turned red, and a circle of light lay on the stone before us. We stood, and we held our head in our hands. We could not conceive of that which we had created. We had touched no flint, made no fire, yet there was light, light that came from nowhere, light from the heart of metal. We blew out the candle, darkness swallowed us, and there was nothing left around us, nothing save the night and a thin thread of flame in it, as a crack in the wall of a prison. We stretched our hands to the wire, and we saw our fingers in the red glow. We could not see our body nor feel it, and in that moment nothing existed save our two hands over a wire glowing in a black abyss. Then we thought of the meaning of that which lay before us. We can light our tunnel, and the city, and all the cities of the world with nothing save metal and wires. We can give our brothers a new light, cleaner and brighter than any they have ever known. The power of the sky can be made to do men's bidding. There are no limits to its secrets and its might, and it can be made to grant us anything if we but choose to ask. Then we knew what we must do. Our discovery is too great for us to waste our time in sweeping streets. We must not keep our secret to ourselves, nor buried under the ground. We must bring it into the sight of all men. We need all our time. We need the workrooms of the home of the scholars. We want the help of our brother scholars and the wisdom joined to ours. There was so much work ahead for all of us, for all the scholars of the world. In a month, the World Council of Scholars is to meet in our city. It is a great council, to which the wisest of all lands are elected, and it meets once a year in the different cities of the earth. We shall go to this council, and we shall lay before them, as our gift, the glass box with the power of the sky. We shall confess everything to them. 
they will see, understand, and forgive. For our gift is greater than our transgression. They will explain it to the Council of Vocations, and we shall be assigned to the home of the scholars. This has never been done before, but neither has a gift such as ours ever been offered to men. We must wait. We must guard our tunnel as we have never guarded it before. For should any men, save the scholars, learn of our secret, they would not understand it, nor would they believe us. They would see nothing save our crime of working alone, and they would destroy us and our light. We care not about our body, but our light is... Yes, we do care. For the first time, we do care about our body, for this wire is a part of our body, as a vein torn from us, glowing with our blood. We are proud of this thread of metal, or of our hands which made it, or is there a line to divide these two? We stretch out our arms. For the first time do we know how strong our arms are, and a strange thought comes to us. We wonder, for the first time in our life, what we look like. Men never see their own faces, and never ask their brothers about it, for it is evil to have concern for their own faces or bodies. But tonight, for a reason we cannot fathom, we wish it were possible to us to know the likeness of our own person. End of chapter 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. Recording by Cherie Terrio. Anthem by Anne Ran. Chapter 6. We have not written for thirty days. For thirty days we have not been here in our tunnel. We had been caught. It happened on that night when we wrote last. We forgot that night to watch the sand and the glass which tells us when three hours have passed and it's time to return to the city theater. When we remembered, the sand had run out. We hastened to the theater, but the big tent stood gray and silent against the sky. The streets of the city lay before us, dark and empty. If we went back to hide in our tunnel, we would be found and our light with us. So we walked to the home of the street sweepers. When the council of the home questioned us, we looked upon the faces of the council, but there was no curiosity in those faces, and no anger, and no mercy. So when the oldest of them asked, where have you been? We thought of our glass box and of our light, and we forgot all else. And we answered, we will not tell you. The oldest did not question us further. They turned to the two youngest and said, and their voice was bored, take our brother Equality 2521 to the Palace of Corrective Detention. Lash them until they tell. So we were taken to the stone room under the Palace of Corrective Detention. This room has no windows and it is empty save for an iron post. Two men stood by the post, naked for leather aprons and leather hoods over their faces. Those who had brought us departed, leaving us to the two judges who stood in a corner of the room. The judges were small, thin men, gray and bent. They gave the signal to the two strong hooded ones. They tore our clothes from our body. They threw us down upon our knees, and they tied our hands to the iron post. The first blow of the lash felt as if our spine had been cut in two. The second blow stopped the first, and for a second we felt nothing. Then pain struck us in our throat and fire ran in our lungs without air, but we did not cry out. The lash whistled like a singing wind. We tried to count the blows, but we lost count. We knew that the blows were falling upon our back. only. We felt nothing upon our back any longer. A flaming grill kept dancing before our eyes, 
and we thought of nothing save that grill, a grill, a grill of red squares, and then we knew that we were looking at the squares of the iron grill in the door, and there was also the squares of the stone on the walls, and the squares which the lash was cutting upon our back, crossing and recrossing itself in our flesh. Then we saw a fist before us. It knocked our chin up and we saw the red froth of our mouth on the withered fingers and the judge asked, where have you been? But we jerked our head away, hid our face upon our tied hands and bit our lips. The lash whistled again. We wondered who was sprinkling burning coal dust upon the floor for we saw drops of red twinkling on the stones around us. Then we knew nothing, save two voices snarling steadily one after the other, even though we knew that they were speaking many minutes apart. Where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been? And our lips moved, but the sound trickled back in our throat, and the sound was only the light, the light, the light. Then we knew nothing. We opened our eyes, lying on our stomach on the brick floor of a cell. We looked upon two hands lying before us on the bricks, and we moved them, and we knew that they were our hands, but we could not move our body. Then we smiled, for we thought of the light, and that we had not betrayed it. We lay in our cell for many days. The door opened twice each day, once for the men who brought us bread and water, and once for the judges. Many judges came to our cell, first the humblest, and then the most honored judges of the city. They stood before us in their white togas, and they asked, Are you ready to speak? But we shook our head, lying before them on the floor, and they departed. We counted each day and each night as it passed. Then, tonight, we knew that we must escape. For tomorrow the World Council of Scholars is to meet in our city. It was easy to escape from the palace of corrective detention. The locks are old on the doors, and there are no guards about. There is no reason to have guards, for men have never defied the councils so far as to escape from whatever place they are ordered to be. Our body is healthy and strength returns to it speedily. We lunged against the door and it gave way. We stole through the dark passages and through the dark streets and down into our tunnel. We lit the candle and we saw that our place had not been found and nothing had been touched, and our glass box stood before us on the cold oven as we had left it. What matter they now, the scars upon our back? Tomorrow in the full light of day we shall take our box and leave our tunnel open and walk through the streets to the home of the scholars. We shall put before them the greatest gift ever offered to men. We shall tell them the truth. We shall hand to them as our confession these pages we have written. We shall join our hands to theirs. We shall work together with the power of the sky for the glory of mankind. Our blessing upon you, our brothers. Tomorrow you will take us back into your fold, and we shall be an outcast no longer. Tomorrow. We shall be one of you again tomorrow. End of chapter 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cherie Terrio. Anthem by Anne Ran. Chapter 7 it is dark here in the forest. The leaves rustle over our head, black against the last gold of the sky. The moss is soft and warm. We shall sleep on this moss for many nights, till the beasts of the forest come to tear our body. We have no bed now, save the moss, and no future, save the beasts. We are old now, yet we were young this morning, when we carried our glass box through the streets of the city to the home of the scholars. No men stopped us, for there were none about the palace of corrective detention, and the others knew nothing. No men stopped us at the gate. We walked through the empty passages and into the great hall where the World Council of Scholars sat in solemn meeting. 
We saw nothing as we entered, save the sky and the great windows, blue and glowing. Then we saw the scholars, who sat around a long table. They were as shapeless clouds huddled at the rise of a great sky. There were the men whose famous names we knew, and others from distant lands whose names we had not heard. We saw a great painting on the wall over their heads of the twenty illustrious men who had invented the candle. All the heads of the council turned to us as we entered. These great and wise of the earth did not know what to think of us. And they looked upon us with wonder and, and curiosity, as if we were a miracle. It is true that our tunic was torn and stained with brown stains, which had been blood. We raised our right arm, and we said, Our greeting to you, our honored brothers of the World Council of Scholars. Then Collective 00009, the oldest and wisest of the council, spoke and asked, Who are you, our brother? For you do not look like a scholar. Our name is Equality, 72521, we answered, and we are a street sweeper of this city. Then it was as if a great wind had struck in the hall, for all the scholars spoke at once, and they were angry and frightened. A street sweeper? A street sweeper walking in upon the World Council of Scholars? It is not to be believed. It is against all the rules and all the laws. But we knew how to stop them. Our brothers, we said, we matter not, nor our transgression. It is only our brother men who matter. Give no thought to us. For we are nothing, but listen to our words, for we bring you a gift such as has never been brought to men. Listen to us, for we hold the future of mankind in our hands. Then they listened. We placed our glass box on the table before them. We spoke of it, and of our long quest, and of our tunnel, and of our escape from the palace of corrective detention. Not a hand moved in that hall as we spoke, nor an eye. Then we put the wires to the box, and they all bent forward and sat still, watching. And we stood still, our eyes upon the wire, and slowly, slowly as a flush of blood, a red flame trembled in the wire. Then the wire glowed. But terror struck the men of the council. They leaped to their feet, they ran from the table, they stood pressed against the wall, huddled together, seeking the warmth of one another's bodies to give them courage. We looked upon them and we laughed and said, Fear nothing, our brothers. There is a great power in these wires, but this power is tamed. It is yours. We give it to you. Still, they would not move. We give you the power of the sky, we cried. We give you the key to the earth. Take it and let us be one of you, the humblest among you. Let us work together and harness this power and make it ease the toil of men. Let us throw away our candles and our torches. Let us flood our cities with light. Let us bring a new light to men. But they looked upon us and suddenly we were afraid. For their eyes were still and small and evil. Our brothers, we cried, have you nothing to say to us? Then Collective 00009 moved forward. They moved to the table and the others followed. Yes, spoke Collective 00009. We have much to say to you. The sound of their voice brought silence to the hall and to the beat of our heart. Yes, said Collective Zero 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 Nine. We have much to say to a wretch who have broken all the laws and who boast of their infamy. How dared you think that your mind held greater wisdom than the minds of your brothers? And if the council had agreed that you be a street sweeper, how dared you think that you could be of greater use to men than in sweeping the streets? How dared you, gutter cleaner? 
spoke fraternity 93452, to hold yourself as one alone and with, and with thoughts of one and not of many. You shall be burned at the stake, said Democracy 46998. No, this shall be lashed, said Unanimity 73304, till there is nothing left under the lashes. No, said Collective 0. Zero, 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 00009. We cannot decide upon this, our brothers. No such crime has ever been committed, and it is not for us to judge, nor for any small council. We shall deliver this creature to the world council itself, and let their will be done. We looked upon them, and we pleaded, Our brothers, y you're right. Let the will of the council be done upon our body. We do not care. But the light? What will you do with the light? Collective zero, 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 00009 looked upon us, and they smiled. So you think you have found a new power? said Collective zero, 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 00009. Do you think all your brothers think that? No, we answered. What is not thought by all men cannot be true, said Collective Zero, 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 Nine. You have worked on this alone? asked International One, Five, Five, Three, Seven. Yes, we answered. What is not done collectively cannot be good, said International One, Five, Five, Three, Seven. Many men in the homes of the scholars have had strange new ideas in the past, said Solidarity 81164, but when the majority of their brother scholars voted against him, they abandoned their ideas, as all men must. This box is useless, said Alliance 67349. Should it be what they claim of it, said Harmony 92642? then it would bring ruin to the Department of Candles. The candle is a great boon to mankind, as approved by all men. Therefore, it cannot be destroyed uh, by the whim of one. This would wreck the plans of the World Council, said Unanimity 29913, and without the plans of the World Council, the sun cannot rise. It took 50 years to secure the approval of all the councils for the candle, and to decide upon the number needed, and to refit the plans so as to make the candles instead of the torches. This touched upon thousands and thousands of men working in scores of states. We cannot alter the plans again so soon. And if this should lighten the toil of men, said Similarity 50306, then it is a great evil, for men have no cause to exist save in toiling for other men. Then Collective 00009 rose and pointed at her box. This thing, they said, must be destroyed. And all the others cried as one, It must be destroyed. Then we leapt to the table. We seized our box, we shoved them aside, and we ran to the window. We turned and we looked at them for the last time. And a rage such as is not fit for humans to know choked our voice in our throat. You fools! we cried. You fools, do you, you thrice damned fools. We swung our fists through the window pane and we leapt out in a ringing rain of glass. We fell, but we never let the box fall from our hands. Then we ran, we ran blindly, and men and houses streaked past us in a torrent without shape. And the road seemed not to be flat before us, but as if it were leaping up to meet us, and we waited for the earth to rise and strike us in the face, but we ran. We knew not where we were going. We knew only that we must run, run to the end of the world, to the end of our days. Then we knew suddenly that we were lying on a soft earth and that we had stopped. Trees taller than we had ever seen before stood over us in a great silence. Then we knew. 
We were in the uncharted forest. We had not thought of coming here, but our legs had carried our wisdom, and our legs had brought us to the uncharted forest against our will. Our glass box lay beside us. We crawled to it, we fell upon it, our face in our arms, and we lay still. We lay thus for a long time. Then we rose, we took our box, and walked on into the forest. It mattered not where we went. We knew that men would not follow us, for they never entered the uncharted forest. We had nothing to fear from them. The forest disposes of its own victims. This gave us no fear either. Only we wished to be away from the city and the air that touches upon the air of the city. So we walked on, our box in our arms, our heart empty. We are doomed. Whatever days are left to us, we shall spend them alone. And we have heard of the corruption to be found in solitude. We have torn ourselves from the truth, which is our brother men, and there is no road back for us, and no redemption. We know these things, but we do not care. We care for nothing on earth. We are tired. Only the glass box in our arms is like a living heart that gives us strength. We have lied to ourselves. We have not built this box for the good of our brothers. We built it for its own sake. It is above all our brothers to us. It is truth above their truth. Why wonder about this? We have not many days to live. We are walking to the fangs awaiting us somewhere among the great silent trees. There is not a thing behind us to regret. Then a blow of pain struck us, our first and our only. We thought of the Golden One. We thought of the Golden One whom we shall never see again. Then the pain passed. It is best. We are one of the damned. It is best if the Golden One forget our name and the body which bore that name. End Chapter 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. Recording by Cherie Terrio. Anthem by Anne Rand. Chapter 8. It has been a day of wonder, this our first day in the forest. We awoke when a ray of sunlight fell across our face. We wanted to leap to our feet, as we have had to leap to our feet every morning of our life, but we remembered suddenly that no bell had rung and there was no bell to ring anywhere. We lay on our back, we threw our arms out, and we looked up at the sky. The leaves had edges of silver that trembled and rippled like a river of green and fire flowing high above us. We did not wish to move. We thought suddenly that we could lie thus as long as we wished, and we laughed loud at the thought. We could also rise or run or leap or fall down again. We were thinking that these were things without sense. But before we knew it, our body had risen in one leap, our arms stretched out of their own will, and our body whirled and whirled, till it raised a wind to rustle through the leaves of the bushes. Then our hands seized a branch and swung us high into a tree, with no aim save the wonder of learning the stretch of our body. The branch snapped under us, and we fell upon the moss that was soft as a cushion. Then our body, losing all sense, rolled over and over on the moss, dry leaves in our tunic, in our hair, in our face, and we heard suddenly that we were laughing, laughing aloud, laughing as if there were no power left in us save laughter. Then we took our glass box, and we went into the forest. We went on, cutting through the branches, 
and it was as if we were swimming through a sea of leaves, with the bushes as waves rising and falling and rising around us and flinging their green sprays high on the treetops. The trees parted before us, calling us forward. The forest seemed to welcome us. We went on, without thought, without care, with nothing to feel save the song of our body. We stopped when we felt hunger. We saw birds in the tree branches and flying from under our footsteps. We picked a stone and sent it as an arrow at a bird. It fell before us. We made a fire. We cooked the bird. We ate it. And no meal had ever tasted better to us. And we thought suddenly that there was this great satisfaction to be found in the food which we need and obtain by our own hand. And we wished to be hungry again, and soon, that we might know again the strange new pride in eating. Then we walked on, and we came to a stream which lay as a streak of glass among the trees. It lay so still that we saw no water but only a cut in the earth in which the trees grew down, upturned, and the sky at the bottom. We knelt by the stream, and we bent down to drink. Then we stopped, for upon the blue of the sky below us we saw our own face for the first time. We sat still, and we held our breath, for our face and our body were beautiful. Our face was not like the faces of our brothers, for we felt no pity when we looked upon it. Our body was not like the bodies of our brothers, for our limbs were straight and thin and hard and strong. And we thought that we could trust this being who looked upon us from the stream, and that we had nothing to fear from this being. We walked on till the sun had set. When the shadows gathered among the trees, we stopped in a hollow between the roots, where we shall sleep tonight. And suddenly, for the first time, this day, we remembered that we are the damned. We remembered it, and we laughed. We are writing this on the paper we had hidden in our tunic together with the written pages we had brought for the World Council of Scholars, but never given to them. We have much to speak of to ourselves, and we hope we shall find the words for it in the days to come. Now we cannot speak for we cannot understand. End chapter 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. Recording by Cherie Terrio. Anthem by Anne Ran, Chapter 9 we have not written for many days. We did not wish to speak, for we needed no words to remember that which has happened to us. It was our second day in the forest that we heard steps behind us. We hid in the bushes and we waited. The steps came closer, and then we saw the fold of a white tunic among the trees and a gleam of gold. We leapt forward, we ran to them, and we stood looking upon the golden one. They saw us, and their hands closed into fists, and the fist pulled their arms down, as if they wished their arms to hold them, while their body swayed, and they could not speak. We dared not come too close to them, we asked, and our voice trembled. How come you to be here, golden one? but they whispered only, We have found you. How came you to be in the forest? We asked. They raised their head, and there was a great pride in their voice. They answered, We have followed you. Then we could not speak, and they said, We heard that you had gone to the uncharted forest, for the whole city is speaking of it. So on the night of the day when we heard it, 
we ran away from the home of the peasants. We found the marks of your feet across the plain where no men walk, so we followed them. And we went into the forest, and we followed the path where the branches were broken by your body. Their white tunic was torn, and the branches had cut the skin of their arms. But they spoke as if they had never taken notice of it, nor of weariness, nor of fear. We have followed you, they said, and we shall follow you wherever you go. If danger threatens you, we shall face it also. If it be death, we shall die with you. You are damned, and we wish to share your damnation. They looked upon us, and their voice was low, but there was bitterness and triumph in their voice. Your eyes are as a flame, but our brothers have neither hope nor fire. Your mouth is cut of granite, but our brothers are soft and humble. Your head is high, but our brothers cringe. You walk, but our brothers crawl. We wish to be damned with you rather than be blessed with all of our brothers. Do as you please with us, but do not send us away from you. Then they knelt and bowed their golden head before us. We had never thought of that which we did. We bent to raise the golden one to their feet, but when we touched them, it was as if madness had stricken us. We seized their body and we pressed our lips to theirs. The golden one breathed once, and their breath was a moan, and then their arms closed around us. We stood together for a long time, and we were frightened that we had lived for 21 years and had never known what joy is possible to men. Then we said, Our dearest one, fear nothing of the forest. There is no danger in solitude. We have no need of our brothers. Let us forget their good and our evil. Let us forget all things save that we are together and that there is joy between us. Give us your hand. Look ahead. It is our own world, Golden One, a strange, unknown world, but our own. Then we walked on into the forest, their hand in ours. And that night, we knew that to hold the body of a woman in our arms is neither ugly nor shameful, but the one ecstasy granted to the race of men. We have walked for many days. The forest has no end, and we seek no end. But each day added to the chain of days between us and the city is like an added blessing. We have made a bow and many arrows. We can kill more birds than we need for our food. We find water and fruit in the forest. At night we choose a clearing and we build a ring of fires around it. We sleep in the midst of that ring and the beasts dare not attack us. We can see their eyes, green and yellow as coals, watching us from the tree branches beyond. The fires smolder as a crown of jewels around us, and smoke stands still in the air, in columns made blue by the moonlight. We sleep together in the midst of the ring, the arms of the golden one around us, their head upon our breast. Some day we shall stop and build a house, when we shall have gone far enough, but we do not have to hasten. The days before us are without end, like the forest. We cannot understand this new life which we have found, yet it seems so clear and so simple. When questions come to puzzle us, we walk faster, then turn and forget all things as we watch the golden one following. The shadows of leaves fall upon their arms as they spread the branches apart, but their shoulders are in the sun. The skin of their arms is like a blue mist, but
but their shoulders are white and glowing, as if the light fell not from above, but rose from under the skin. We watch the leaf which has fallen upon their shoulder, and it lies at the curve of their neck. And a drop of dew glistens upon it like a jewel. They approach us and they stop, laughing, knowing what we think, and they wait obediently without question till it pleases us to turn and go on. We go on, and we bless the earth under our feet, but questions come to us again as we walk in silence. If that we have found is the corruption of solitude, then what can men wish for save corruption? If this is the great evil of being alone, then what is good and what is evil? Everything which comes from the many is good. Everything which comes from one is evil. Thus we have been taught with our first breath. We have broken the law, but we have never doubted it. Yet now, as we walk the forest, we are learning to doubt. There is no life for men save in useful toil for the good of their brothers. But we live not when we toiled for our brothers. We were only weary. There is no joy for men save the joy shared with all their brothers. But the only things which taught us joy were the power created in our wires and the golden one. And both these joys belong to us alone. They came from us alone. They bear no relation to our brothers, and they do not concern our brothers in any way. Thus do we wonder. There is some error, one frightful error, in the thinking of men. What is that error? We do not know, but the knowledge struggles within us, struggles to be born. Today the Golden One stopped suddenly and said, We love you. But then they frowned and shook their head and looked at us helplessly. No, they whispered, that is not what we wish to say. They were silent, then they spoke slowly, and their words were halting, like the words of a child learning to speak for the first time. We are one, alone, and only, and we love you who are one, alone, and only. We looked into each other's eyes, and we knew that the breath of a miracle had touched us and fled and left us groping vainly. And we felt torn, torn for some word we could not find. End chapter 9 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cherie Terrio. Anthem by Anne Rand. Chapter 10. We are sitting at a table. And we are writing this upon paper made thousands of years ago. The light is dim, and we cannot see the golden one. Only one lock of gold on the pillow of an ancient bed. This is our home. We came upon it today at sunrise. For many days we have been crossing a chain of mountains. The forest rose among cliffs, and whenever we walked out upon a barren stretch of rock, we saw great peaks before us in the west and to the north of us and to the south, as far as our eyes could see. The peaks were red and brown, with the green streaks of forest as veins upon them, with blue mists as veils over their heads. We had never heard of these mountains, nor seen them marked on any map. The uncharted forest has protected them from the cities and from the men of the cities. We climbed paths where the wild goat dared not follow. Stones rolled from under our feet, and we heard them striking the rocks below, farther and farther down, and the mountains rang with each stroke, and long after the strokes had died. But we went on, for we knew that no men would ever follow our track nor reach us here. Then today, at sunrise, we saw a white flame among the trees, high on a sheer peak before us. 
We thought that it was a fire and we stopped, but the flame was unmoving, yet blinding as liquid metal. So we climbed towards it through the rocks, and there before us, on a broad summit, with the mountains rising behind it, stood a house such as we had never seen, and the white fire came from the sun on the glass of its windows. The house had two stories and a strange roof flat as a floor. There was more window than wall upon its walls, and the windows went on straight around the corners, though how this house kept standing we could not guess. The walls were hard and smooth, of that stone unlike stone which we had seen in our tunnel. We both knew it without words. This house was left from the unmentionable times. The trees had protected it from time and weather, and from men who have less pity than time and weather. We turned to the Golden One and we asked, Are you afraid? But they shook their head, so we walked to the door and we threw it open, and we stepped together into the house of the unmentionable times. We shall need the days and the years ahead to look, to learn, and to understand the things of this house. Today, we could only look and try to believe the sight of our eyes. We pulled the heavy curtains from the windows and we saw that the rooms were small, and we thought that not more than twelve men could have lived here. We thought it strange that man had been permitted to build a house for only twelve. Never had we seen rooms so full of light. The sun rays danced upon the colors, colors, and more colors than we thought possible. We who had seen no houses save the white ones, the brown ones, and the gray. There were great pieces of glass on the walls, but it was not glass, for when we looked upon it, we saw our own bodies and all the things behind us, as on the face of a lake. There were strange things which we had never seen, and the use of which we do not know. And there were globes of glass everywhere, in each room, the globes with the metal cobwebs inside, such as we had seen in our tunnel. We found the sleeping hall, and we stood in awe upon its threshold. For it was a small room, and there were only two beds in it. We found no other beds in the house, and then we knew that only two had lived here, and this passes understanding. What kind of world did they have, the men of the unmentionable times? We found garments, and the golden one gasped at the sight of them, for they were not white tunics nor white togas. They were of all colors, no two of them alike. Some crumbled to dust as we touched them, but others were of heavier cloth, and they felt soft and new in our fingers. We found a room with walls made of shelves, which held rows of manuscripts from the floor to the ceiling. Never had we seen such a number of them, nor of such strange shape. They were not soft and rolled. They had hard shells of cloth and leather, and the letters on their pages were small, and so even that we wondered at the men who had such handwriting. We glanced through the pages, and we saw that they were written in our language, but we found many words which we could not understand. Tomorrow we shall begin to read these scripts. When we had seen all the rooms of the house, we looked at the golden one, and we knew the thought in our minds. We shall never leave this house, we said, nor let it be taken from us. This is our home and the end of our journey. This is your house, golden one, and ours, and it belongs to no other men, whatever, as far as the earth may stretch. We shall not share it with others, and we share not our joy with them, nor our love, nor our hunger. So be it to the end of our days. Your will be done, they said. Then we went out to gather wood for the great hearth of our home. We brought water from the stream which runs among the trees under our windows. We killed a mountain goat, and we brought its flesh to be cooked in a strange copper pot we found in a place of wonders, which must have been the cooking room of the house. We did this work alone, 
for no words of ours could take the golden one away from the big glass which is not glass. They stood before it and they looked and looked upon their own body. When the sun sank beyond the mountains, the golden one fell asleep on the floor amidst jewels and bottles of crystal and flowers of silk. We lifted the golden one in our arms and we carried them to a bed, their head falling softly upon our shoulder. Then we lit a candle and we brought paper from the room of the manuscripts and we sat by the window for we knew that we could not sleep tonight. And now we look upon the earth and the sky. This spread of naked rock and peaks and moonlight is like a world ready to be born. It seems to us it asks a sign from us, a spark, a first commandment. We cannot know what word we are to give, nor what great deed this earth expects to witness. We know it waits. It seems to say it has great gifts to lay before us. We are to speak. We are to give its goal, its highest meaning to all this glowing space of rock and sky. We look ahead. We beg our heart for guidance in answering this call no voice has spoken, yet we have heard. We look upon our hands. We see the dusts of centuries, the dusts which hid great secrets and perhaps great evils, and yet it stirs no fear within our heart but only silent reverence and pity. May knowledge come to us. What is this secret our heart has understood and yet will not reveal to us, although it seems to beat as if it were endeavoring to tell it? End chapter 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Cherie Terrio. Anthem by Anne Ran. Chapter 11. I am. I think. I will. My hands my spirit, my sky, my forest, this earth of mine. What must I say besides? These are the words. This is the answer. I stand here on the summit of the mountain. I lift my head and I spread my arms. This my body and spirit, this is the end of the quest. I wish to know the meaning of things. I am the meaning. I wish to find a warrant for being. I need no warrant for being. And no word of sanction upon my being. I am the warrant and the sanction. It is my eyes which see, and the sight of my eyes grants beauty to the earth. It is my ears which hear, and the hearing of my ears gives its song to the world. It is my mind which thinks, and the judgment of my mind is the only searchlight that can find the truth. It is my will which chooses, and the choice of my will is the only edict I must respect. Many words have been granted me, and some are wise, and some are false, but only three are holy. I will it. Whatever road I take, the guiding star is within me, the guiding star and the lodestone which point the way. They point in but one direction. They point to me. I know not if this earth on which I stand is the core of the universe, or if it is a speck of dust lost in eternity, I know not, and I care not, for I know what happiness is possible to me on earth, and my happiness needs no higher aim to vindicate it. My happiness is not the means to any end. It is the end. It is its own goal. It is its own purpose. Neither am I the means to any end others may wish to accomplish. 
I am not a tool for their use. I am not a servant of their needs. I am not a bandage for their wounds. I am not a sacrifice on their altars. I am a man. This miracle of me is mine to own and keep, and mine to guard, and mine to use, and mine to kneel before. I do not surrender my treasures, nor do I share them. The fortune of my spirit is not to be blown into coins of brass and flung to the winds as alms for the poor of the spirit. I guard my treasures, my thought, my will, my freedom, and the greatest of these is freedom. I owe nothing to my brothers, nor do I gather debts from them. I ask none to live for me, nor do I live for any others. I covet no man's soul, nor is my soul theirs to covet. I am neither foe nor friend to my brothers, but such as each of them shall deserve of me. And to earn my love, my brothers must do more than to have been born. I do not grant my love without reason nor to any chancer by who may wish to claim it. I honor men with my love, but honor is a thing to be earned. I shall choose friends among men, but neither slave nor masters, and I shall choose only such as please me, and them I shall love and respect, but neither command nor obey. And we shall join our hands when we wish, or walk alone when we so desire. For in the temple of his spirit each man is alone. Let each man keep his temple untouched and undefiled. Then let him join hands with others if he wishes, but only beyond his holy threshold. For the word we must never be spoken save by one's choice and as a second thought. This word must never be placed first within man's soul, else it becomes a monster, the root of all the evils on earth, the root of man's torture by men, and an unspeakable lie. The word we is as lime poured over men, which sets and hardens to stone, and crushes all beneath it, and that which is white and that which is black are lost equally in the gray of it, and it is the word by which the depraved steal the virtue of the good, by which the weak steal the might of the strong, and by which the fools steal the wisdom of the sages. What is my joy if all hands, even the unclean, can reach into it? What is my wisdom if even the fools can dictate to me? What is my freedom if all creatures, even the botched and impotent, are my masters? What is my life if I am but to bow, to agree, and to obey? But I am done with this creed of corruption. I am done with the monster of we, the word of serfdom, of plunder, of misery, and falsehood and shame. And now I see the face of God, and I raise this God over the earth, and this God whom men have sought since men came into being, this God who will grant them joy and peace and pride. This God, this one word. I. End chapter 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Cherie Terrio. Anthem by Anne Rand. Chapter 12. It was when I read the first of the books I found in my house that I saw the word I, and when I understood this word, the book fell from my hands, and I wept. I, who had never known tears, I wept in deliverance and in pity for all mankind. I understood the blessed thing which I had called my curse. I understood why the best in me had been my sins and my transgressions, and why I had never felt guilt in my sins. I understood that centuries of chains and lashes will not kill the spirit of man, nor the sense of truth within him. I read many books for many days. Then I called the Golden One, and I told her what I had read and what I had learned. She looked at me, and the first words she spoke were, I love you. Then I said, My dearest one, it is not proper for men to be without names. There was a time when each man had a name of his own to distinguish him from all other men. So let us choose our names. I have read of a man who lived many thousands of years ago, and of all the names in these books, his is the one I wish to bear. He took the light of the gods and brought it to men, and he taught men to be gods. And he suffered for his deed, as all bearers of light must suffer. His name was Prometheus. It shall be your name, said the Golden One. And I have read of a goddess, I said, who was the mother of the earth and of all the gods. Her name was Gaia. Let this be your name, my Golden One, for you are to be the mother of a new kind of gods. It shall be my name, said the Golden One. Now I look ahead. My future is clear before me. The saint of the pyre had seen the future when he chose me as his heir, as the heir of all the saints and all the martyrs who came before him and who died for the same cause, for the same word, no matter what name they gave to their cause and their truth. I shall live here in my own house. I shall take my food from the earth by the toil of my own hands. I shall learn many secrets from my books. Through the years ahead, I shall rebuild the achievements of the past and open the way to carry them further. The achievements which are open to me, but close forever to my brothers, for their minds are shackled to the weakest and dullest among them. I have learned that the power of the sky was known to men long ago. They called it electricity. It was the power that moved their greatest invention. It lit this house with light that came from those globes of glass on the walls. I have found the engine which produced this light. I shall learn how to repair it and how to make it work again. I shall learn how to use the wires which carry this power. Then I shall build a barrier of wires around my home and across the paths which lead to my home. A barrier light as a cobweb, more impassable than a wall of granite, a barrier my brothers will never be able to cross, for they have nothing to fight me with save the brute force of their numbers. I have my mind. Then here, on this mountain top, with the world below me and nothing above me but the sun, I shall live my own truth. Gaia is pregnant with my child. He will be taught to say I and to bear the pride of it. He will be taught to walk straight on his own feet. He will be taught reverence for his own spirit. When I shall have read all the books and learned my new way, when my home will be ready and my earth tilled, I shall steal one day for the last time into the cursed city of my birth. I shall call to me my friend who has no name save International 48818 and all those like him, Fraternity 25503, who cries without reason and solidarity 
1-800-889-6347 who calls for help in the night, and a few others. I shall call to me all the men and women whose spirit has not been killed within them and who suffer under the yoke of their brothers. They will follow me, and I shall lead them to my fortress. And here, in this uncharted wilderness, I and they, my chosen friends, my fellow builders, shall write the first chapter in the new history of man. These are the last things before me, and as I stand here at the door of glory, I look behind me for the last time. I look upon the history of men, which I have learned from the books, and I wonder. It was a long story, and the spirit which moved it was the spirit of man's freedom. But what is freedom? Freedom from what? There is nothing to take a man's freedom away from him save other men. To be free... A man must be free of his brothers. That is freedom. That and nothing else. At first, man was enslaved by the gods, but he broke their chains. Then he was enslaved by the kings, but he broke their chains. He was enslaved by his birth, by his kin, by his race, but he broke their chains. He declared to all his brothers that a man has rights which neither God nor king nor other men can take away from him, no matter what their number, for his is, is the right of man, and there is no right on earth above this right. And he stood on the threshold of freedom for which the blood of the centuries behind him had spilled. But then he gave up all he had won and fell lower than his savage beginning. What brought it to pass? What disaster took their reason away from men? What whiplashed them to their knees in shame and submission? The worship of the word, we. When men accepted that worship, the structure of centuries collapsed about them. The structure whose every beam had come from the thought of some one man, each in his day, down the ages, from the depths of some one spirit, such as spirit existed, but for its own sake. Those men who survived, those eager to obey, eager to live for one another, since they had nothing else to vindicate them, those men could neither carry on nor preserve what they had received. Thus did all thought, all science, all wisdom perish on earth. Thus did men, men with nothing to offer save their great numbers, lose the steel towers, the flying ships, the power wires, all the things that had not created and could never keep. Perhaps later some men had been born with the mind and the courage to recover these things which were lost, Perhaps these men came before the Council of Scholars. They answered as I had been answered, and for the same reasons. But I still wonder how it was possible in those graceless years of transition long ago that men did not see whither they were going and went on in blindness and cowardice to their fate. I wonder, for it is hard for me to conceive how men who knew the word I, could give it up and not know what they had lost. But such has been the story, for I have lived in the city of the damned, and I know what horror men permitted to be brought upon them. Perhaps in those days there were a few among men, a few of clear sight and clean soul, who refused to surrender that word. What agony must have been theirs before that which they saw coming and could not stop? Perhaps they cried out in protest and in warning, but men paid no heed to their warning. And they, those few, fought a hopeless battle, and they perished with their banners smeared by their own blood. And they chose to perish, for they knew. To them, 
I send my salute across the centuries and my pity. Theirs is the banner in my hand, and I wish I had the power to tell them that the despair of their hearts was not to be final, and their night was not without hope, for the battle they lost can never be lost, for that which they died to save can never perish. Through all the darkness, through all the shame of which men are capable, the spirit of man will remain alive on this earth. It may sleep, but it will awaken. It may wear chains, but it will break through. And man will go on. Man, not men. Here on this mountain, I and my sons and my chosen friends shall build our new land and our fort, and it will become as the heart of the earth, lost and hidden at first, but beating, beating louder each day. And word of it will reach every corner of the earth, and the roads of the world will become as veins, which will carry the best of the world's blood to my threshold, and all my brothers and the counsel of my brothers will hear of it, but they will be impotent against me, and the day will come when I shall break the chains of the earth and raise the cities of the enslaved, and my home will become the capital of a world where each man will be free to exist for his own sake. For the coming of that day I shall fight, I and my sons, and my chosen friends, for the freedom of man, for his rights, for his life, for his honor. And here, over the portals of my fort, I shall cut in the stone the word which is to be my beacon and my banner, the word which will not die, should we all perish in battle, the word which can never die on this earth, for it is the heart of it, and the meaning, and the glory. The sacred word, ego. End chapter 12. End of Anthem by Anne Rand.